Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. I'm glad we all made it in relatively safely. It's a little slippery out there, but we're thankful that we can gather this morning in the name of the Lord to worship Him together as His people, as those who've been called to come and be with Him even this morning and to praise His name together. It is good and right to do so because Jesus has called us to follow Him. So part of following Him is worshiping Him together. So let's join in the call to worship, which is found in the front of your bulletin from Psalm 33. Our, Lord, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, we come to you this morning with expectant hearts. Lord, we open our hands and ask for you to bless us as we gather to worship you. And yet we come not uh, just for ourselves. We come because you are worth it. Our souls wait for you because you are our help. You are our shield. Our hearts are glad in you. We trust in you because of your steadfast love. Oh, Lord, we love you. Thank you for putting uh, your love in our hearts. So help us to walk in in your way, to love you all the more, and to love each other, to love those around us with the love of God that is in us. So accept our prayers and praises because of your spirit in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's join our voices. Please stand if you are able, and let's sing Blessed Assurance, hymn page 314. Blessed Assurance, please stand with me if you're able. Hymn page 314, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine.
Our God is indeed great, and He is at the same exact time gracious. He is great and He is gracious, and He is willing, ready, and able to forgive us our many sins, because the scriptures say, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Brothers and sisters, that is the assurance that we have as we come to the Lord and ask forgiveness for our sins, that He does indeed forgive us and wash us clean. So let's take a few moments of individual confession in silence at this time to bring our burdens to the Lord. Oh Lord, you are great and you are gracious. You are good. We see your greatness all around us in the heavens and the earth and everything in them that you made by your word. And we see your greatness because of your grace through Jesus Christ who died for our sins on the cross so we might be forgiven and have new life. For you, O oh Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. So we call upon you now and ask you to continue to be good and forgiving and gracious in your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join our voices together one more time. You can uh, remain seated for this hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Hymn page 319, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
Our scripture reading for this morning is found in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 7 through verse 19. It's found in your insert, if you care to follow along, and Carol will be coming to read for us. So please open your scriptures, or perhaps your inserts, to Mark chapter 3, verse 7 to 19. Good morning. morning. A multitude at the lakeside. Jesus departed with his disciples to the lake, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, hearing all that he was doing. They came to him in great numbers from Judea, Jerusalem, Dume, beyond the Jordan, and the region around Tyre and Sidon. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crush him. For he had cured many so that all who had diseases pressed upon him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, You are the Son of God. But he sternly ordered them not to make him known. He went up the mountain and called to those whom he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. So he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonergus, that is, sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and the James, and James, son of Aphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, Jesus and Belzebub. Then he went home. Thank you, Carol. This is the word of the Lord. It is true, trustworthy, and we look for the Spirit to use it to change our lives, even today. We'll be looking a little closer at that passage in a few moments. Well, now's our opportunity to take up our offering for the week, for our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. If you are our guest, please feel under no obligation or compulsion to contribute. This is an opportunity for those of us in this church family to give to the Lord what he has called us to give, to contribute to the work of the gospel here and around the world. And Michelle and I will be singing a song. It's not the one I've listed. I changed our minds. We changed our minds. Uh, I can't even remember the name of the song we're doing. It is well. It is well, yes. It, it's a, 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 a variation on the theme of It Is Well With My Soul. So uh, will the ushers please come forward? I just wanted to say one thing about this song. Um, I'm sure everyone in here can relate to going through something difficult in your life, through a trial, um, and sometimes feeling like, where's God in this? Where is he? I don't hear him. I don't see him. Um, But I think um, this song talks about how through it all, as we keep our eyes fixed on him, we make it through. We don't necessarily know how, and we don't necessarily always know in the moment or in the future, but he does not let us go. And there's a part in in this song that says, the waves and the wind still know his name. And that draws from a story in the Bible about how Jesus calmed the waves and the, and the wind and said, peace, be still. So um, whether you're in a storm or you know someone in the storm, as we sing this morning, um, have that prayer in your heart that God's peace would come to you or come to your loved one or friend. Um, John 16, says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It is well with me. 
when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all
three to end the four. You know Carol, right? Yeah. <laughs> She's your grandmother, so. Hold on, let me get my act together. When Carol was reading for us, it was. What she read in the scriptures was kind of a summary, right? Did you notice it said, hey, this is what Jesus was doing? And he was healing people, and there was this big crowd. Have you ever been in a really big crowd? Have you ever been in like, have you ever been to like a baseball game or a football game or no, really have those right good. Um, have you ever been to a concert? There's a lot of like a kids concert? No? You've been to a big concert in Bell. What concert did you go to? Boston Colleges? Boston College, okay. How's that in Bell? Was it awesome? Well, when you're in a big crowd, it's so exciting, right? There's, and usually there's there's a reason that the crowd is together. Like there's a concert, or there's a game. Um, there was a game on, on TV last week. Did anybody see that? Football game? No? We won't talk about that game. There was a you know, there was a football game on last week. We watched it at our house and it was the Super Bowl, you got it. And uh, there was like millions and millions of people that were watching on TV that, that game. Because it's so exciting to see that game happening. So Jesus didn't have millions and millions of people because there weren't millions of people around at that point. Uh, but he had so many people coming to him, not because he was a good football player, not because he was a good singer, but he was a healer. So if you had somebody in your life or even yourself that was like really sick, you would you could come to Jesus at that point, and if you could find him, get to him, he would heal you. So that made so many people excited to come hear him, and he would preach the gospel of God's love and grace and truth, and everyone was super excited. Now, if you were in that crowd, what would you think if Jesus was like, okay, you, come here. You'd be like, uh-oh. Me? Seriously? What if the, the concert people that Annabelle was at, what if they're like, oh my goodness, cutest baby in the world, can you come here and be in our band, please? That would be awesome. Or if, if you know, we went to a concert last summer and there was, there was a Patriot Stadium and there was like, I don't know, 50,000 people there. What if the guys were like, hey, you up there in row 100, come on down. I want you to be part of my band. <laughs> You'd be like, whoa, this is awesome. Well, the, the story that Carol read for us, that's sort of what happened. There was all these thousands of people, and Jesus says, you guys, you 12 people, I want you to be part of my band, my followers. My special followers who are going to help me spread the good news of God's love all through the world. And they weren't any, but they were very special. They were kind of messed up people. But Jesus called them to be part of his kingdom. And hugs are a big part of the kingdom, aren't they? Yes, hugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we're talking about today is, are you part of the crowd, or are you part of the called? The crowd, you know, Jesus attracts a crowd, but he calls out, he calls everybody to follow him, and he says, all right, are you going to follow me or not? That's the question that we have from Jesus. Can you follow me? All right, that's what I got for you today. And somebody else you know is going to be doing Sunday school today. My mom. Your mom, yeah. <laughs> and um, you guys can you know, do that. Well, we uh, keep on going here. Although, I hope Annabelle stays because we, we just cannot have more than enough of her here. All right, let me pray for us and then we can go on to Sunday school. Father, thank you for this calling that you put on our hearts. Thank you, Jesus, that you are so amazing that you attract big, big crowds. And so as we look to follow you, help us to hear your voice and say, yes, you are the one I want to follow me. So I pray for these kids and the parents and, and all of our church family, Lord, that we would hear your voice when we are in the crowd, that we would hear your voice calling us out to follow you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, please take out your scriptures once more, and let's take a closer look at Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. Let me get myself set up here. All right. So I hope using the screen has been helpful for you this, uh, during this series on Mark. Uh, I found it a little distracting for myself, personally, so I'm dialing it back a little bit. We'll have a little bit of outline here, but not a ton of stuff because I found myself going too many directions at once, so uh, hopefully uh, this is a help as we try to look to the Word together and look to God's Spirit to show us what He has for us, even this morning. So, are you a fan or are you a follower? Are you in the crowd or are you one of the called? So, we've had, I mentioned with the kids, we've had some big crowds lately, right? We've had a big crowd at the Super Bowl. Did anybody watch the Super Bowl? We watched the Super Bowl at our house and uh, it was pretty good until the very end. Um, if the Pats had any sort of deep, anyway, whatever. <laughs> But I looked up some stuff. There was 67-ish thousand, 67,000 people there for that And around the U.S., there was approximately 103 million people watching that football game. Does anybody know how many people, the population of the United States? Roughly 330 million. So about a third of our nation was watching that football game. And then we got the Olympics now, we got the Super Bowl's old news, we got the Olympics now. And so, uh, you know, there's 28 million people watching the opening ceremonies. That's a lot of people. And, uh, but when Jesus said, according to scientists, there was probably less than 300 million people in the entire world. 2,000 years ago, the population of the world, according to scientists, was probably less than 300 million. And the population of Jesus' home country was about 600,000. So why do I go over all these facts and figures? Because Jesus was a superstar in his day. Because he, he wasn't a football player, obviously. He wasn't a, a, a pop singer. He wasn't an Olympian. He was a healer. He attracted a crowd. And it's almost about, you know, you, you think of, a, you know, you had a picture Bible when you were a kid, or you see a picture on the wall, or whatever, and you see the crowds, and people are just sort of milling, it's kind of like that, right? People are kind of milling about, oh, this is nice, let's hear what this guy has to say. And then it's, it's, it seems like a pleasant scene, right? And every day you'll see a, a kid with a lamb wandering by, right? And it's, it's a very gentle scene. Well, it was, it was probably dangerous to be there because the crowd's pushing in. Um, I've never been in a situation where I felt like fear of a crowd. Maybe some of you have been, or you know, in danger of a stampede. That's that's nothing to mess around with. And did you notice in the scripture that Jesus said, "Well, let's get a boat ready because I might get stampeded." So this was kind of a dangerous situation, and and yet the people kept kept coming. And Jesus never really had a cross word for the crowd. You read the commentators and listen to sermons or whatever, and usually people will start bashing the crowd. Oh, look, that crowd, they only wanted to get what they could get out of them. And they didn't really care about what Jesus was having to say. They just wanted what they wanted. Oh, that crowd, I can't stand that crowd. Jesus was never that way. Jesus spoke to the crowd. He preached to the crowd. He fed the crowd. In another story, which we'll get to eventually. And he had compassion on the crowd. So, one thing to notice as we look at the scripture, uh, here's a map of Palestine, of Israel. And um, maybe if you've got a, a Bible with maps in the back, this is actually a copy of the exact type that I've got in my Bible. Uh, this is a map of 
Palestine in Jesus' day. And um, it's just yeah, it works. So up here is where Jesus was in the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee. Did you know the Sea of Galilee was smaller than Lake Bonson? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they call it the sea, but well, the, the, the translation that Carol read for us, I think, said lake. And other translations say sea. It was a lake, but it was a dangerous lake because of the topography. But, anyways, so Jesus lived probably in Capernaum. That's where Peter lived. He probably lived with Peter. Um, and so that's where he, his home base was. And if you notice the scripture, it says, you, of course, we don't really know what these names mean unless you really look it up, but it says he's from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, Edomea, from Jordan, Tyre, Sidon. We just read those names and kind of stumble across them. What does it really mean? It means people were coming from everywhere. So actually, the Palestine is roughly the same size as Vermont. So really, let's pretend, okay, Jesus was in the Northeast Kingdom and people were coming from Canada People were coming from New Hampshire. People were coming, yeah, from Bennington. People were coming from Brattleboro. People were coming from Burlington. People were just coming. And it was roughly the size of our state. And people just packed up and went to follow Jesus. And some of the crowds that, you know, that Jesus fed at the feeding of the 5,000, this was probably 20,000 people. That's, does anybody know the population of Bennington? Around 20,000. Around 20. The last census was, the town itself was 15,000. The county is 36,000. Anybody know the population of Eagle Bridge? 150. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I looked it up, I looked it up recently, about 2,000. Anybody know the population of Woodford? <laughs> about 400. <laughs> Jasper, you know, Jasper, town over, like 3,500 each. So we got whole towns full of people showing up to hear Jesus. They were eager for healing. They were eager for healing in their bodies and their spirits. They were threatening to crush him. But they were also threatening to crown him. We don't really get that dynamic so much right here, but if you see in verse 11... It says, uh, the unclean spirits saw him. They fell down and cried out, you are the Son of God. In verse 12, Jesus strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now people ask, and we've heard even the last couple months, why does Jesus keep saying, hush, hush, don't tell anybody. Quit it, stop it. So why would Jesus do that? Because he didn't want to be crushed so much. He wasn't, it wasn't yet his time for uh, the ministry that God had called them to, and people had their own expectations on Jesus. Maybe you have your own expectations on Jesus. I know I do. But it's one thing to be part of the crowd, and it's quite another to be called out of the crowd. It's one thing to be part of the crowd, and it's quite another to be called out of the crowd. Have you ever been called out of a crowd? Yes. <laughs> Somebody is. Oh, hold on, I gotta take this. Hello? I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of something. Who's this? Really? Really? Um, yeah, can we talk about this later? Alright, thanks. So, that, let's pretend, that was uh, the, the lead singer of my favorite rock band. And he, he saw me when I was in the, he just had a quick conversation. Uh, he saw me when I was at the concert, and there was, uh, what was there, I looked it up, how many people were there this past summer? I think like 55,000 people, yeah, 55,000 people were there at this concert, and he saw me and Caleb up on the, on the top deck, and he heard me sing along, and then he looked at my YouTube channel, and he said, I want you to be part of my band. So what do you think I should, I should say to that, you know? Should I be part of the, the best band, best band in the history of rock and roll, or should I just, you know, keep doing my thing? Well, it's a little bit like Jesus calling out from people from this huge crowd and saying, "I want you 
to be part of my band. I am calling you. I want you. What if, what if your favorite singer said, or favorite athlete, or whatever, said, I'm calling you. I want you. I'm going to make you into something great. I'm going to give you a new name. I want you to be with me. And I want you to go out and share this great stuff that we've got. So, are we part of the crowd? Are we part of the call? So, did you notice that when we get to verse 13, Jesus calls the disciples. Now, we call the 12 disciples, we also call the 12 apostles. Disciple means follower, apostle means someone sent out. And we have apostle big A, the 12, but we're also, anyone who's following Jesus is sent out, little a, apostles. So they were called, probably not on the phone, but they were called. Did you see that Jesus desires them? Jesus desires them. He called to him those whom he desired in verse 13. Isn't it nice to be wanted? It's, it's always nice to be wanted. Jesus makes them. He, uh, the word here that we have in our translation in your insert, it says he appointed 12. That word appointed actually means, uh, you could also translate it probably more accurately, made. He made the 12. And actually the, the, the word behind that word made is poema, poem. Like an artist, like a poet makes a poem, Jesus makes his disciples into something wonderful. Jesus calls them, Jesus desires them, Jesus makes them, and Jesus names them. Naming is a big deal in the scriptures. Whoever names you, in a certain sense, owns you, right? You give a kid a pet, that kid gets to name the pet, right? Because they're the ones who it belongs to. Whoever names you is the one that you belong to. And sometimes we, we rename ourselves in a certain sense to say, I belong to myself. I'm going to rename myself. But really, Jesus is the only one who can truly name us. This is not part of my thing, so. <laughs> I appreciate the serendipity here, but. <laughs> so the call, it's the call. Feel, feel free. It might be Jesus. I don't know. <laughs> um, to be, they're called, did you notice, um, in verse, uh, where did we go? In verse 14. Now, if, if the first time I read this, you go right by it. And maybe it could go right by you too. But he said, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him. Let's stop there. So they might be with him. If you are called to follow Jesus, and I hope and pray you are or will be sometime very soon, if you're called to follow Jesus, you're called to be with Him. We, at least myself, I think most of us in our culture, in our society, are doers. We consider ourselves, we don't, call, we don't really act like human beings, we act like human doings. <laughs> are you a human doing or are you a human being? Jesus is calling his apostles to be with him. Have you thought about that idea of just being with Jesus? Now, in our Bible study on Tuesdays, 7 o'clock, 3.35 on the street, you're all invited. Bible study Tuesdays, we were looking at a chapter on the scriptures. And the, the author was saying, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually be with Jesus in the flesh right now? Wouldn't that be great? That would be awesome. And that's one of the reasons we look forward to going to heaven, because we will be with him. And when he comes back and makes the heavens and earth new again, we will be with him. But we can be with him now. Because his spirit speaks to us through his scriptures. He is with us when we pray with him. He is with us when we draw near to Him in prayer. When we draw near to Him when we open the Scriptures. It is mysterious. It is powerful. It is true. That we are with Jesus. And even silent prayer, even meditation on the Scriptures, there's all, 
all these ways that, that we've recognized over the years of Christianity. Yes, we are with Jesus. So, I know I do this way too often. I, I can imagine some of us also are in this place. I skip over the being with, and I go straight to the doing. Or if I'm feeling lazy that day, I go straight to doing nothing, and I still skip the <laughs> yes. being with. And that's just all sorts of that stuff. So we are called to be with Jesus. And you might be thinking, how do I be with Jesus? How do I be with Jesus? Open the scriptures. Read, read his word. Open your heart to his spirit working in you. Pray. Be with him. Because he is with you in your life, in your heart. Well, they're called not to only be with him, but to be sent out. The, the Christian walk, I've heard it described as, as breathing. You breathe in, you breathe out. You breathe in, Jesus, you breathe out, Jesus. You are called to be with him, you're called to send out. It's a dance. Sometimes it's both. You know, when you're sent out, you're obviously, you don't leave him behind. You go with him. He goes with you. They are sent out. And the scriptures here in verse 14, again, he appointed the twelve, he named apostles, so that they might be with them. He might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So you might be saying, wait a second, preacher. You're telling me to preach and you're telling me to cast out demons. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe that's good. Cool. Well, again, we've got big A apostles, these twelve folks, and we've got little A apostles. That would be all who are followers of Jesus. We are called as his people to be sent out into the world to share his love with our words and with our deeds. By preaching, maybe in this type of preaching, but as far as I know, I doubt most of us here feel like God is leading you to stand up in front of a crowd, open the scriptures, and try to explain it. And apply it. That's uh, that's happened. I'm very happy that that's my particular role of this particular body. But that doesn't get anybody else off the hook because you have people in your life. Somebody mentioned, uh, you know, my coworker is, is having major surgery. I don't know that person, but one of our church members here knows that person. Now, is he going to stand up and say, "Please open your Bibles to da 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 to that guy"? <laughs> Not necessarily, but could our church member say, you know, I've, I've been praying about your surgery and uh, the scripture came to mind, you mind if I read it to you? You know, Psalm 23 or whatever. That to me, in a sense, is preaching. No, we wouldn't call it preaching, but it's sharing the word of God, sharing the good news of the gospel to whoever is in your life. So we too are called to, to be sent out to preach. Like, did you notice both of these things? That's just what Jesus was doing. He wanted them to preach. He wanted them to cast out demons and heal. That's the, just being like Jesus. And you might be also wondering, well, is this scripture calling me, or is this preacher asking me to cast out demons? That's that's not normal, is it? At least not in our culture. And yet, it does happen. Uh, I'm happy to discuss with whoever may be interested, but we, I've got stories I can tell about here in Bennington, actual demons being cast out. Amazing. And God's power is working. But we're not all called to take part in that specific ministry necessarily, but we are all called to bear light in the darkness. Wherever you go, you bear light for Jesus. And it reminds me of the scripture where Jesus said, you know, a light is not supposed to be sort of back scale where you put it on a stand. The light is supposed to be held up. So you too are called to push back the darkness. You might be called to actually pray and be a part of casting out actual demons. You might be. I'm not going to discount that. But anywhere from that to 
pushing back the darkness wherever <laughs> you find it. You know, I mean, this is kind of a dumb e example, but I used to really like mowing the lawn because I don't really like it anymore. But <laughs> I used to like mowing the lawn because we would, I would always let it get too far, so it would just be nasty, right? It would just to me it would be like, you know, well the garden of Eden was perfect. And then the uh, you know sin happened, you know, people sinned, and then it got weeds and nastiness and thorns and whatever. And my lawn always looked like after, right? Nothing before. <laughs> so when you go mow the lawn, and you're like, I'm pushing back the darkness, I'm making things look nice. <laughs> and this is a dumb example, but God has called His people, of which you, I pray, and I know many, if not most, if not all of us here either now or will be, in the kingdom to push back that darkness through the power of Jesus. Because Jesus called them, yes, to push back the darkness, yes, to preach, but not on their own. First, he called them to be with them. So you're not alone when, because we are all in this together. So Jesus called them, Jesus calls you. Jesus Desire them. Jesus desires you. I ran across a bunch of people this week of all sorts. You know, sometimes God just sends people. And that's great. All sorts of people. And they all had roughly the same need. They all needed to know that God loved them. They all needed to know that. And you've got people in your life that needs, need to know God loves you. You, yourself, needs to know that God loves you. I need to know that God loves you. And He desires you. He wants you. He doesn't just put up with you. He's created you to be exactly who you are. So you can be exactly what He wants you to be. He desires you. And He makes you. He's remaking you. And He names you. I wrote a little piece for the, the banner last week that talks about names. Like, what, what do names mean? And really, as we are followers of Jesus, we are named Christians. And that word has a lot of baggage in our culture, but it really means follower of Jesus. He names you. And just like the, the disciples, He wanted them to be with Him. He wants you to be with Him. He wants you to be sent out. Yes, as I mentioned, the twelve apostles were special, a special case. They were the ones that actually spent time with Jesus when he was on earth. Once they died, roughly, you know, John, the, the writer of John was probably the last one living, uh, roughly AD 90, he's probably when he uh, passed away. Uh, so the, the twelve capital A apostles, that era, in my opinion, is over. We can debate this if you like that kind of thing, I'll be new. A couple of my friends here might want to dig into that. But <laughs> we are to at least have little a apostles. We are called. We are sent out. Now to, to kind of wrap up here, I don't want to miss the names. Yeah, you know, thank you, Carol, for kind of working through these names. I know some of them are tricky as we read them, but and maybe it's my weird sense of humor. Because I noticed that Jesus is funny with these names. He gave two, he gave three people nicknames. He called, and I think the funniest one, uh, if, you, if you remember one of the stories, it says in verse 17, James, son of Zebedee, and John, brother of James, what's their nicknames? The sons of thunder. <laughs> Do you know what these guys are famous for? Well, Infamous for and one of the passages of scripture, they were like, it's in Luke, I can't remember, I forgot to write the reference, but I'll look it up for you. Oh. And they said, hey Jesus, those people, they're doing bad stuff. Can we please call thunder and lightning on them? <laughs> <laughs> it's these two guys, James and John, these two guys. They said, can we call lightning down on those guys? Because they're, they're not with us. And of course, Jesus probably was like, <laughs> I think it's hilarious that he named them Sons of Thunder. Because that was probably the stupidest thing they've ever done. And Jesus 
kind of gives them a little, hey guys, I think you're so funny. You're so funny. It's fun to me, and then also with Peter. Now Peter famously is Simon, now he's Peter. Peter means rock. On this rock I'll build my church. Well, Peter was not so much of a rock, was he? If you know Peter's story, read the Gospels. And, and Peter was all over the place. He was impetuous, he was impatient, he was violent. He said some of the dumbest things in Scripture too. And, and yet he was the rock. You know, you can think of the actor guy, the rock, right? I don't think he was, looked anything and acted anything like the rock. Because he was just as messed up as James and John, and it's pretty clear Peter, James, and John were, were what you might call the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. These three guys get their, in my opinion, funny nicknames, and they're the closest ones to Jesus, because Jesus knows their weaknesses. Jesus knows, all right, we hear this stuff, I hear this stuff, I feel like, uh, you got the wrong person some days that feel like that, right? Where, yeah, yeah, this is this is nice, but I'm not so sure I can live up to this. And then you go and Jesus like he kind of gives you a wink and says, Yeah, I know. I know. I've got these two sons of thunder. I got this I got this rock. He knows. He has made those bullheaded guys into instruments to you to spread the gospel through the whole world. If he can do that with those guys, he can surely do that here with me, with you, with all of us as we come together for the gospel. And this, the last thing I'll say about the list of names here, did you know a bunch of these names we have no idea anything about them? None whatsoever. We just know their names. So they were called to be Jesus' 12 disciples, and we can be sure that God used them, but they're pretty much obscure. One of my pastors over the years, his uh, name is Thaddeus, one of the names there. And I love the fact that he was named after one of the obscure apostles because he was, is being used to spread the gospel in his place and time and sooner or later, nobody's going to remember it. And that's okay. Nobody's going to remember me sooner or later. That's okay. Nobody's going to remember you sooner or later. That's okay, because nobody really remembers anything about Thaddeus, for example. Just that he was a follower of Jesus. He was sent to be with. He was sent out and he was also called to be with Jesus. Because Jesus calls you. Jesus desires you. Jesus is making you. And Jesus is naming you so you can be with him. And so you can be sent out to preach, to teach, to, to share the gospel one way or another, to push back the darkness. This is the calling that we've been called to. So let's look to him for the strength to fulfill that calling, even this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you call us. You call us out of the darkness and into the light. So, Lord, help us to keep on following you. And, Lord, if, if we're here this morning and we're not following you, would you show us the next steps so we might begin to follow you? May we repent of our sins and, and trust in you and follow you one step at a time. Thank you that you are a gentle and good shepherd. You are a good leader. And we love you and thank you. We ask you to send your spirit to give us the strength to follow you even today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's conclude our service together by singing When We Walk with the Lord. Please stand if you're able. Hymn number 321, When We Walk with the Lord.
So that trusting and obeying, I believe, is a, another way to say to be with him, to trust him, to have faith in him, and to be sent out to obey. So as, as we go out this week, hear the benediction of the Lord. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.